All right, welcome to a very special tandem breakdown. I've been doing a series of these, and this is my second one with my friend Dan Hardy, my favorite analyst and commentator in the game. Dan, thanks for joining me. Thank you, man. It's good to be here again. Uh, okay, we got to get right into this one. This one's happening in Ottawa, Ontario, in our neck of the woods. Uh, Rory McDonald and Wonder Boy. Are you coming out to call this one? I wish I was, but no, I'm not, unfortunately. Uh, this is a beautiful fight. We were talking about Rockhold, which got us talking about Dominic Cruz and Dillashaw, and we started talking about movement a little bit and how challenging it is to solve the problem of these movers, of these guys, I call it the movement movement, that where we're seeing guys solve other challenges with movement. So we saw Wonder Boy deal with Hendricks. After he beat up Hendricks, Hendricks said, geez, I wish he stood in the pocket with me more, which of course makes no sense. Why would he do that? He controlled the distance, made Hendricks have, have to rush in. When he rushed in, he rushed through the chaos. Talk to me about Wonder Boy and what makes him unique and special. Um, what, one thing to start with is the way he stands. Most people don't stand side on anymore in MMA. Uh, I mean, not many people did in the first place because it generally didn't work. Um, but we're starting to see that a little more. I mean, Connor stands with quite a long, quite side-on stance, although his hips are slightly more turned towards his opponent than Stephen Thompson's. Um, you know, it's definitely an, an unorthodox way of standing. We saw the same with Machida, but even so, his hips are more square, more facing his opponent. Whereas Wonder Boy has got that really nice, real traditional, almost like Taekwondo like side stance that I used to compete in with Taekwondo, where you can just lift that front leg and just slap somebody across the face with it. Um, and something else that I have noticed, I mean, he's, I think his takedown defense is 80-something percent. And after the Matt Brown fight, we saw major improvements in that. What I'm noticing is that partly because he's southpaw fighting mostly orthodox fighters, and partly because he stands entirely side on, when people shoot, they've got to attack that front leg first. It has to be a, a single leg takedown. And because he's so well balanced and he's so spread, it, it, he's got a very, very good uh, ability to stuff that takedown and to stay on his feet until they get into the fence where he can start defending it. So um, I think although it's, it's a very un unusual way to stand, I think that's what's helping him because most people in the gym won't stand like that when you're sparring. Um, yeah, when it comes to his wrestling, it's, uh, I find it really interesting. Remember when, when Ronda fought Holly Holm and the next day people were like, why didn't she shoot any takedowns? Mm. The, the best defense to takedowns are the ones where they never get in on you. They never get to your hips. Step one, if you and I are standing facing each other, step one for my takedown is I must get my hands on you. And if we can prevent that, we can prevent hundreds of takedowns that just never take place. And I think that his movement of his feet makes that step one very difficult. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I love that side-on stance for the sidekick, whether he just bounces with the back leg and drives it forward, or he intercepts you coming in, or it's low, or it's medium, or it's high. It becomes like, like a, a hot force field, like a barrier, a bubble on the outside, that if you deal with it and you get touched at it a few times, it becomes something sort of very nerve-wracking. It raises the tension and the temperature with that kick. So then you have to really push through it. Not unlike what we were talking about a, a week or two ago with Rockhold, uh, you have to find your way through that bubble. And he, do, he and his father believed that the boxing range is something that you you don't deal with. We don't box. We don't w w box in boxing range. We force you to come through it so fast that it's almost a reverse punch. It's like an intercepting fist. And it's a really cool, challenging game that has been built around his karate room. Yeah, well, it's keeping people outside of that range that they would normally spar in. You know, even as a, even as a kickboxer, predominantly a, a kicker when I first started, I became much more of a boxer when I started sparring them with MMA fighters because we all stand pretty much in boxing range. I mean, it's quite comfortable to shoot from a boxing stance and it's quite easy to defend a takedown from a boxing stance. Whereas when you stand side on, you feel so limited with mixed martial arts. You have to adapt everything that you do to incorporate wrestling right, and things like that. So most people just don't don't invest in that type of stance. Whereas because Wonder Boy's got, you know, 60, almost 60 fights under his belt as a kickboxer, He's had time to develop that and to understand how to control those ranges as people move forward. Um, I mean, the, the, the hop side kick, the step side kick is really nice. I mean, the, the, the danger to that is obviously if, if it goes past your opponent and they get around to the side, but along with all the spinning techniques he's got, it makes people very cautious about lateral movement as well. 
we were talking when we talked about uh, Dominic and how going through time, it's like, oh man, these wrestlers are getting us down. How do we deal with it? People just try to wrestle better as the answer until later they find that there's an answer to beat that answer. And we were discussing how it's really tough to deal with this sort of outer orbit of these kicks, uh, whether we're talking about Cruz, whether we're talking about McGregor to a degree, whether we're talking about Rockhold, people who kind of keep you stressed on the outside. And one of the answers to me, I, I, I believe, is we have to take the threat of that kick, that the fact that as we get in, our temperature rises and our heart rate goes up and we're stressed out. And instead of seeing it as this risk, we see it as an opportunity. When the kick comes out, we're going to catch it. When the kick comes out, we're going to deflect it and come in. And it's sort of a psychological setting that that kick is not, oh my God, where's he gonna kick me? What's gonna happen when he kicks me? It's cool, he will give me an opportunity to grab his foot. Do you see that as, an, as one of the answers to this type of movement-based outside fighter? I do, yeah, I do. But what's interesting about it, and it's the same with boxing, when you throw a punch at somebody's face, their natural instinct is to do the opposite of what a boxing coach would tell you to do. You, they, they, you know, naturally, you want to close your eyes, pull your chin up in the air, and turn your head away. It's the worst thing to do. You know, and a boxing coach will tell you to keep your eyes open, tuck your chin, and move towards the punch and slip mm -hmm. to one side or the other. When it comes to kicking, when you know somebody that's, that's proficient with their legs, you, you tend to stand in kicking range. It's the weirdest thing, and I see fighters do. I used to see fighters do it with me when I was throwing head kicks and stuff. Like they, they stand right in the range because they feel like they're out of range because they can't punch you, so they're standing in your kicking range. And, and Wonder Boy utilizes that that very very well. You know, the, the, like you said, that the first thing you've got to do is get across that get across that psychological barrier of, well, this is the range in which I'm safe. I need to be closer to this guy. That's why Matt Brown had success with him because Matt Brown doesn't let you breathe. And he was able to walk through the shots that most people would try and sidestep. But, you know, that hard-headedness at least allowed him to get inside and land some good, clean shots. And it took it out of Thompson. I mean, you know, the pressure that he was feeling in that fight was what exhausted him, in my opinion. You know, his conditioning, I don't think, failed him. I think it was the pressure that Brown was putting him on. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and that is a beautiful fight to go back and watch on Fight Pass because sort of uh, Matt Brown and uh, Rick Story, and there's a few of these guys who just being a, a, a genetically better alpha than us is part of how they built their game. It's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. But it, we exist as a culture and as a species because naturally when something hurts us, we move away from it. And you, you guys who fight at the highest level, one of the early things that makes you successful is being able to overcome that natural setting and move into the fire. Um, but yeah, you're right. There's something, whether it's that praying mantis convincing the other one to dance the way you dance, there's something about these, guy, these outside fighters who program the opponent. But I think Rory will not be programmed that way. I think Rory, one, has the fearlessness, but two, has the awareness of this game. He's also sparred with Thompson before. And they're good kickers, and they're good kick catchers. And, and Rory is, uh, their whole team are kickers as well. So I think he understands this outside element of this fight. I, I agree, you know, and they've got first-hand experience having Stephen Thompson up there. I, I actually, I think I was there a week or so after Wonder Boy was helping George out for one of his fights. And I remember when I got there, GSP was talking about how impressive he was as a kickboxer. I, I even think GSP said that I can't think of an, another guy that I've, I've sparred with that was as good, you know, in the striking range. So. That's got to show you how impressed people were with him at TriStar, so it's not like they're not going to be taking him seriously. You know, the other thing as well is that they, they've prepared for all different types of strikers, kickboxers, and they know how to how to build a training camp around someone like that. So, you know, Roy McDonald's probably in the best place to, to prepare for this fight because of, of the wealth of experience and, and the amount of different people on that mat at TriStar as well. Um, you know, it, it's Wonder Boy brings an interesting skill set, but in the modern age of mixed martial arts, you know, we've still kind of seen everything now. It's just a case of equating those skills to those fighters, and, and TriStar can do that very well. Yeah. Uh, when I think of Rory's kicking game, one kick comes to mind, and, and it's this sort of, it, it's not a throwaway front kick, but I think of it as a, as a table clearer. You know, in a Western, when they're sitting at the table and they're playing cards, and somebody flips the table and comes out shooting, and it kind of clears the space? He kind of uses that front kick that way. You know what I mean? Mm. And I'm trying to picture that using that, filling that space with that kick 
will ver will change that game from Wonder Boy's outside orbit bubble to that reverse punch and kind of fill that, make that space dangerous. And then also because, and, and uh, Stephen Thompson told me this specifically, he's like, we just stay away from that boxing range. We don't believe that's the place to fight. So if we're Rory and we're, and we're for us, that's where we want to fight. Yeah, definitely. It's got to be that that outside octagon, that, that that black line on the inside. Rory needs to spend as much time as possible with Wonder Boy up against the fence. You know, we we talked we talked earlier about about how his his stance is um, is a real benefit to him, but he doesn't like the boxing range, and you could tell that in the Matt Brown fight. You know, when, when that range was closed down on him, he doesn't shorten his stance. He doesn't turn into a boxer. He doesn't adapt to that closing of that range. He he looks like a kickboxer that's stuck. And, and you'll see it because his stance doesn't get any narrower. It, it gets wider, but he squares it to his opponent. So he actually ends up standing with his back square against the fence, which doesn't even give him a great deal of mobility and does put him on his heels if you hit him. Now, Rory's very much a forward-backwards kind of fighter. And if, if he's going to pin him down, he's got to be against the fence. I think Rory's got to be smart about this and use that long-range jab just to at least corral him. And accept that he's going to take some shots on the way in, but it, it's, it's going to be a it's going to be a rough affair for him. He's really got to uh, got to be the bully in this fight. Um, you just made me think of something I wanted to chat with you about, and that is you've talked about Rory's long range jab, and when he's fighting southpaws, he fought um, uh, Robbie Lawler, and in their second fight, he was trying to jab inside, so he would mm -hmm. keep his foot inside. That's and that foot outside inside foot thing. I think in the beginning. People heavy-handed say we need our we need you know lead foot dominance. We must have that foot outside. But over time, I think these top fighters realize we don't have to keep that foot outside. If we keep that foot outside, it gives us X, Y, and Z advantages. If we put the foot inside, it makes my opponent feel he has X, Y, and Z advantages. So I can now anticipate or draw out his his attacks. And I feel like against. Lawler, he was looking to jab inside of his jab, fully aware that the straight, the, the straight right was coming down the pipe with the plan to slip and counter. He yeah. just couldn't do it. Uh, I believe he, he believed he was ready to slip and counter Lawler's straight right hand and just couldn't do it. But against uh, Stephen Thompson, I think that game is there now because he doesn't have the same sort of boxing ability and that sort of almost reverse punch intercepting fist thing I don't think is as dangerous to him in there as Robbie Lawler cracking you in the nose. No, I, I agree. I think, I mean, Robbie Lawler is much better at that lean back counter that he's got. And, and you know, he needs to hit you with a 50% punch and it's going to hurt. Yeah. And that foot placement, you're right. You know, we, we, talked, to, we talked a while ago about the, um, uh, the rock hold check right hook. If you look at his foot placement, he puts his foot on the inside of, of the lead foot of his opponent, which generally you, you wouldn't do in a, in a boxing situation. You want to keep your foot on the outside so you can control the jab. Whereas he actually puts it on the inside so his opponent feels like they can close that range. And then he's got that nice tight counter right hook. It, it, it's the same situation. You know, we're, we're starting to see other elements of, of combat come into mixed martial arts because the game's so different in MMA. And, and that is one of the things, the placement of the foot, you know, southpaw to orthodox. Yeah, and, and fascinating that in the broad strokes, people always like, keep your front foot on the outside. Lawler wants to keep his front foot on the inside, so Rory tried to beat him to the inside on that. Just fascinating little fights. And speaking of uh, the little fights, you mentioned uh, Rory wants to push him to the cage. Uh, That's a question I have for you from a training perspective, from an active fighter perspective. Do you feel like in that sort of vertical playing surface, um, vertical grappling against the cage, that there aren't many tricks left. That you know the game that your opponent is trying to do. You're trying to fight for inside bicep control. You're trying to fight for head position. And that we, both you and I, if we're elite guys, we know all of the little battles and we just have to win them and be in better shape. Yeah, yeah. I think it's getting to the stage where, where we're not seeing a great deal of surprises anymore with that clinch work. But, you know, if you watch people sparring, if you watch people training in the gym, whenever they're, they're, whenever they're in that clinch position, they they don't they don't step outside of themselves very often. And this is where John Jones is shocking a lot of people. If you watch his fight against Glover Teixeira, when he was in that oh, clinch position, he put on an elbow clinic. We saw the same thing against uh, with, with Condit against uh, Alves in the second round. In my opinion, that is that is one of the areas in, in mixed martial arts which is going to develop the most over the next five years, mm -hmm. especially now we've seen 
uh, and I think I've mentioned it before. Now we've seen teams like American uh, uh, AKA and Tiger Muay Thai set up in Thailand, and we can have that integration of the of the Muay Thai into mixed martial arts. That standing clinch game is going to be absolutely vicious in a few years' time, and I think that that is where we really start to see interesting developments in the clinch, the Greco stuff, and, and even you know the the level change in the trips and the reaps that we see. You couple that with some nice Muay Thai clinch work, and that that adds 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 a whole new layer to the fight. And I think it's your job and my job and John's job and six or eight other people to really let people see how beautiful that game is. I think uh, to a certain degree, the audience is into a certain thing and they're on the ground, something's happening, and they see that as a throwaway range. And I think if they started to view it as that your different parts of your body, whether your hip, your shoulder, your hand, are all different members of a team, and so it's a team game as you're applying different team members to different spots trying to win little individual battles like football or soccer. I think if we break that down for people, they can see the little battle. So it isn't just, because right now people are like, well, there's no takedown attempts. You know, you'll see uh, you know, two minutes against the fence. And somebody said, well, they were against the fence, but there was no takedown attempts. Takedown attempts are at the end of a series of cool little battles that I think it's our job to let people see so that more and more people over time see how awesome that, that range is and that zone is. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, it's like, I mean, a lot of ball sports, a lot of team sports that involve a ball, you know, you've got a certain amount of players that are, that are their responsibility is marking the players that are available, and then you've got the offensive players that are still trying to work at the same time. Whereas, as as a combat athlete, you have to do the whole thing at the same yeah. time. You have to be control, be you know, be interested in controlling your opponent to a point, but you also have to be offensive as well, knowing that you know the referee will keep the fight moving if you stay there too long. Yeah, super cool. But well, we'll work on that. We'll work on trying to make sure that people see how cool that stuff is. Uh, I, we're going to do a few more of these. And I thank you for, for getting together with me, Dan. It's, it's cool. I know people will like it, but I'm really enjoying chatting with you. I'm really enjoying bouncing these thoughts back and forth. Uh, so before we go, I mean, we're already probably at 20 minutes on this fight. But uh, on the ground, I think we all have a fairly solid understanding that if Rory can establish a position, so not an open-ended grappling series or sequences, but if he can establish a position that he's going to be dominant. And there's no doubt Wonder Boy's got better and better in those areas, but the goal for, for Rory is to establish that. And you've got to figure his game is going to work best for that purpose, working off the body lock. And I feel like that's something the best guys are doing now, getting to that body lock, working from a real tight lower back pressure so that when you hit the ground, you're already in half or inside or getting a guy to give up his back to get back to his feet. Yeah, yeah. We see it with, uh, with, with Demetrius Johnson quite a lot. You know, he gets that body lock. And same with Frankie Edgar so good at orbiting around their mm. opponent, spinning around and changing the position of that body lock without ever losing control. Um, most definitely, if Rory's on top, it's going to be a, a nightmarish fight for Wonderboy. But at the same time, you know, Wonderboy changes so much between fights. I mean, he went from getting taken down and, and controlled on the ground from Matt Brown to in his next fight, he went straight out and he, he worked clinch and, and tried to work takedowns. You know what I mean? He, he's, in, he's interested in developing his game. He's interested in showing other people what he can do. We can't also forget that he's been working with Chris Weidman as well, you know? And that's that's a camp that's hungry at the moment. That's a Chris Weidman that's frustrated that he lost his belt. So there's a lot of work going in that gym at the moment, and I'm sure Wonder Boy's making the most of it. Well, I wish you were here in Canada for this one, but uh, we will see you out there another time, and we'll do another one or two of these over the next week or so. Uh, Dan, thanks so much, man. I'm really enjoying hanging out and chatting with you. Likewise, my friend. Good talking to you again.